Life in the Trinity Ministry, in partnership with Brian McLaren, is pleased to present this series entitled, The Storyline of the Bible. Uh, great to be with you all again. We are working our way through the biblical narrative, uh, trying to get what you might call a narrative theology. Uh, very often we work with what people call a systematic theology, meaning we pick a topic and then we find all the verses in the Bible that deal with that topic, and then we try to make propositions based on those selected passages. And there's certainly some value to that, although there's a lot of problems with it. Uh, and uh, this is why a lot of us are showing increased interest in narrative theology, which uh, seeks to understand the Bible as a story. It locates, it, it doesn't want, in this approach, you don't want to just look at verses uh, extracted from the text. You want to look at those verses in the context of their particular uh, piece of literature uh, where you find them, whether that's poetry or history or uh, or whatever. And then uh, you see that within its historical context, and then you put all of that together in, this, in, in a kind of a broad sweep of a narrative. You look for a developing plot. You look for uh, the, ways, the ways that ideas develop and change over time. You look for a direction and what some people call a trajectory. And that's what we're doing. And we've uh, been looking at the Bible in, in uh, seven episodes, and we're almost finished with the sixth episode, uh, which is the episode of the church or the commissioned community. Uh, I, I heard some friends refer to it recently as the revolution that Jesus started. And uh, uh, that's uh, especially interesting language to me because I've been thinking a lot about the church as a revolutionary community. Uh, in fact, that's reflected in the title of my next book, which is called Everything Much Must Change, Jesus, Global Crises, and a Revolution of Hope. Uh, but uh, uh, an awful lot of times, I think we have to begin by saying the church isn't nearly as revolutionary as we might hope, and sometimes we're downright funny. And... Uh, uh, I thought I'd just begin, you've probably heard a lot of these, but I thought I'd begin uh, by poking a little fun at ourselves in the church uh, with some of the famous church bulletin bloopers that have been collected and disseminated. I'll just uh, share with you a couple of these. Uh, here's one. Uh, Scouts are saving aluminum cans, bottles, and other items to be recycled. Proceeds will be used to cripple children. <laughs> There's a great revolutionary cause. Um, the outreach committee has enlisted 25 visitors to make calls on people who are not afflicted with any church. <laughs> That's how we feel sometimes. Um, easy typo to make. Evening massage, 6 p.m. Uh, here's another one. The pastor would appreciate it if the ladies of the congregation would lend him their electric girdles for the pancake breakfast next Sunday morning. Uh, <laughs> here's one that could last a while. The audience is asked to remain seated until the end of the recession. Uh, here's a very depressing one. The low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 to 8 30 PM. Please use the back door. <laughs> uh, and this one would be sure to get attention. Another easy typo to make. Ushers will eat late comers. Well, uh, we've all seen, uh, we, we've all seen an awful lot of the embarrassing sides of the church. We have this high calling and we have this this great vision of what the church is supposed to be. But we have to remember, we need to accept the church as it is. And as it is, it's human beings. And all of them have flaws and all of them make mistakes. Uh, I, uh, I just... It's one of the things I try to do with my own failures and sins. I try to at least booby trap them. I, I wish I didn't sin. I wish I didn't fail. Uh, but when I do, I try to keep it big enough in my own mind that it reminds me to be as merciful to other people as I need God and others to be to me. And, and I think a sense of humor helps. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also maybe some uh, insight from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, the great German theologian, uh, who died in, uh, during World War II. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a powerful book called Life Together uh, during the rise of the Nazi uh, regime, which co-opted so much of the German church. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others banded together in, uh, in what you might call communities of resistance. They, they were communities that, that didn't want to be sucked into the uh, politicization of, uh, of the church being sucked into the whole Nazi mentality and movement. 
And uh, in this context, Bonhoeffer experienced depths of Christian community uh, that he'd never before known. And he, he recorded a lot of his insights in this beautiful short book called Life Together. And one of the great insights in this book, I encourage you to read it, uh, but one of the great insights in the book, it, he uses a term, I'm sure it's much more interesting in German, but in English, it's the term wish dream. And he said, we can have wish dreams of the church that we love so dearly that we, they become uh, they, they become a form of sabotage. We love our dreams so much that we start resenting the people who get in the way of our dream. For example, you know, you have a small group meeting or a church meeting, and, and you have this ideal, this wish dream that will be open and will share and will go really deep. And so then you get together on Wednesday night at 7.30, and uh, brother uh, Joe shows up, and Joe just talks and talks and talks. He could bore the bark off a tree. He is just so long-winded, and he just loves to hear himself talk. And you're sitting there thinking, I want this to be a beautiful Christian community, and that idiot is talking so much, and he always talks. And your resentment is just boiling under the surface, you know. And here in the name of Christian community, you're hating your brother who's getting in the way of your ideal of Christian community being realized. Well, I've experienced that so many times, and uh, I just think we need a good dose of humility whenever we talk about the church. Uh, One of the things that's especially uh, troublesome to me is uh, is the way that our churches so often attack one another. I I've been noticing this recently because I'm quite frequently uh, the uh, the target of a number of attacks, and uh, it, it strikes me. I've heard a lot of Christians complain about how badly they're treated by the secular media, uh, but uh, I don't think anyone treats Christians as badly as uh, other Christians. I don't think the secular media has ever been as vicious to any sector of the church as the church uh, frequently is to other sectors of the church. So uh, what, what this suggests to me is that, uh, that we, need to have to, we need to find a way to think about the church that doesn't su- subject the rest of the church to our, our wish dreams. Uh, a buddy of mine, uh, one buddy of mine calls th- this tendency in the church to inflict such carnage on other uh, sectors of the church. He, he calls it spiritual McCarthyism, where we launch uh, uh, into uh, uh, kind of red threat inquisitions. Another friend calls it uh, uh, religious supremacy, where each religious group is fighting for supremacy over the others. And it's a lot like white supremacy. It's just based on doctrine rather than skin color. Uh, I, I, another friend talks about the evangelical Taliban. <laughs> and uh, we, sh- we can see an awful lot of this kind of ugly uh, police state mentality. Uh, and uh, another friend calls it spiritual apartheid. Uh, where we want to break people into classes or groups and argue for which group is legitimate and which group should be dominant and, and all the rest. And and this is so sad because it's such a denial of the message of Jesus. So how, how do we uh, embrace, how do we reach our arms out and embrace the church and understand it in a way that helps us not to be uh, so, so judgmental and such a contradiction of our message? Um, uh, I, I wrote a whole book about this. It was called The Generous Orthodoxy, and it was my attempt to to uh, try to open arms wide to the whole church. And And one of the concepts that's really helped me in the last few years is a concept I got from a friend of mine named uh, Andrew Jones. You might know him on the internet, tallskinnykiwi.com. And I'm very glad to hear that Andrew is planning to uh, finally put some of this into book form himself. But Andrew talks about a deep ecclesiology. And the idea of a deep ecclesiology is that we learn to honor the church in all its forms, ecclesiology being the study of the church. A deep ecclesiology would say we could arrange the church from its highest forms, and you can define that however you want, uh, to its lowest forms. Consider that whole range, if we were to, to put them in a hierarchy from top to bottom, 
And then what we, in a sense, do is we turn that sideways and we say, but you know what? God is working through all of the sectors of the church, the entire range, and uh, and each has strengths and each has weaknesses. So let's honor the church in all of its forms. Now, when you talk about forms of church, this might be helpful. I, I think we can put the church into four basic levels. Uh, at the top would be uh, the... Uh, the, the more hierarchical churches, we could call them the Episcopal churches. The word episkopos means overseer. And the, these are churches that r- roughly you could say they're, they're top-down churches. They're led by bishops or, or groups of bishops who are called cardinals, or, and there might be a presiding, someone presiding over them called the Pope. Um, but there, there, there is a sense that the hierarchy is held by a group of people, held together by one or more people at the top. And there is a kind of top-down chain of command in these churches. This would be uh, the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman Catholic churches, most obviously, and then the Anglican Episcopal communions that, uh, that in name at least, function uh, in an Episcopal way. Uh, the Methodists are also structured this way. But then you end up with a kind of uh, a gray area uh, because one form often overlaps with, with other forms. And the second form is what we could call the Presbyterian form. Um, and this is a, a, a form of church government that is maybe most similar to uh, the U.S. government, to representative democracy, where you have leaders, but the leaders are uh, chosen by the congregation. Uh, but those leaders then do exercise authority over the church. So um, there is involvement at the grassroots by voting. Uh, they vote representatives who then exercise leadership. Uh, and that's the, the Presbyterian structure. Uh, and then we could go one level for, down from there. I'm not using down in a pejorative way, but to congregational churches. And these are churches that uh, uh, elect leaders, uh, so they kind of go from the bottom up, ele- electing leaders. But those leaders are only responsible for one individual church. They, they don't uh, create levels of uh, structure above the individual church. Now, this is where it gets complicated because You could say there are two kinds of congregational churches. There are congregational churches that choose to voluntarily associate. Um, So the Southern Baptist Convention or uh, uh, the Assemblies of God, they, uh, they, they are, have local church autonomy, but they form an association or an assembly of, uh, of churches. And sometimes it's hard to distinguish, uh, where, you know, one, one type begins and another type ends. Um, uh, but one way to find these churches is that it's very easy for them to disassociate and pull out. And uh, uh, and then um, you could go, the, the other kind of congregational church, maybe the, the bottom half of the congregational churches would be the independent congregational churches. And these are churches that are not part of any official association uh, of uh, of local churches. So those would be our three main kinds of churches, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Congregational. We could go one level down from there, and we could talk about uh, churches that we might call informal churches, or uh, some friends of mine call them uh, simple churches. And these are churches that have no official structure at all. Their their relationships are uh, are uh, there. There are real leaders in these groups. Uh, but uh, but their relationships aren't formalized. There there might be no constitution, or it would be very very loose, um, and uh, uh, and there's a proliferation of these kinds of churches. Uh, I think in recent years, uh, and uh, sometimes and, and these are an important part of what people often refer to as the emerging church. But what I think the emerging church really is 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 churches who share this deep ecclesiology. So if you have people uh, on the category of simple churches, my fourth category, who have respect for the people in the Episcopal, Presbyterian, and Congregational churches and realize that we all have a job to do, uh, and and you have people who are Presbyterian who respect the Episcopal, Congregational, and simple, uh, you know, it, it, when you have people respecting each other at all of these levels, that to me is something very new and unique. A couple of other observations about this deep ecclesiology the church, I think we'd agree, started as a simple uh, structure. 
uh, there, there wasn't, you know, the, in the book of Acts, the, the form of the church evolves over time. And it seems to have evolved from simple uh, to Episcopal. But then with the Reformation, it seems that there's been a, a downward mobility again. And so we had uh, Presbyterian and Congregational and, and simple churches form uh, in, in the last 500 years. Uh, so the church has been very, very flexible and adaptable. And, and to me, this is a strength of the church. And these different structures in a deep ecclesiology, I don't think we see as competing structures. We don't need to argue one is right and the others are wrong. E- each of us may be fully convinced that one is better than the other, or one is the kind we'd like to be involved in. But we, we have to acknowledge that uh, God appears to have lower standards than we do in the sense that God works with and blesses all of these different kinds of churches, even if we don't. Uh, but uh, to me, what's very uh, fascinating in, in this deep ecclesiology is for us to start seeing these different forms of church, not as divisions, but as diversifications. Uh, I might think of this in, uh, in evolutionary terms. Uh, maybe you've studied or read about the Darwin's finches, the finches in the Galapagos Islands. And uh, you have finches, they look like sparrows. I've actually been there and seen them. They, they just look like sparrows, but they have different kinds of uh, beaks. So some of them have a very thin beak that turns out to be extremely good for finding, catching insects. Others have a very thick beak, which turns out to be very good for breaking seeds open so you can live on seeds. And uh, evolutionary theory suggests that all of these finches have a common ancestor, but they were developed by natural selection. They diversified on the different islands and became uh, quite different morphologically, uh, meaning in their, in their physical form. And, um, uh, and I think we could say that this is what happens to the church. And, and, and one of the beautiful ideas of uh, evolution in the Galapagos Islands is that if there is a drought on an island that wipes out one species of finch, because no seeds can grow, um, but there are still some insects around, well then there are still some finches that can, uh, can survive uh, the wiping out of, a, of another species, uh, or, or one of their cousin species, we could say. And I think this is a great way to think about the church. Uh, we, we carry on the message, we carry on the gene pool, so to speak. We carry on the family tree. And uh, we all have a job to do, and, and the sector of the church that I work with may have a good job o- to do over 300 years and then may pass out of existence. Uh, but thank God that other sectors of the church continue. And uh, so to me, this is a humbling way for us to see the church, s- to, to stop seeing our group or our preferred form as the superior form, and instead to have a broad and deep respect for the church in all of its forms. I hope that helps you when you think about the church. Uh, you, you, you can look at the whole range of churches and say, thank God. Uh, and, and where, where they're proud and arrogant, you just say that's a, a failure that they all share. Uh, but where they're humble and respectful and accepting of one another, uh, you see that that promotes the possibilities for cross pollination, for learning from one another. And, uh, we're carrying on the way of Christ, uh, it, along with the name Christian. Uh, Kind of a good idea for churches, I think you'd agree. Uh, Well, next time we'll talk a little bit more about the church. Uh, We'll talk about uh, some of these issues of church structure, and then I'd like to talk about uh, the way that Christian churches should relate to people of other religions, because this is very, very important when we look across church history and very important in our world today. Thanks so much for being uh, being part of this podcast today. Uh, you are an expression of the church, and uh, may you carry the, the way of Christ, the image of Christ, the love of Christ, the message of Christ with you wherever you go today. God bless you. This is Brian McLaren for WiredParish.com. You've been listening to WiredParish.com. Visit us online for exclusive podcasts with some of the most challenging writers, thinkers, and speakers in the church. We bring you Coffee House Conversations with the best and the brightest. Tune in, turn on, get wired. WiredParish.com